Centre in Bergen's Clinic in three years. And this is one of the projects that I've worked on, or one of the ideas that I've worked on, both in England and in Norway. And there's been enthusiasm for putting it into practice. So uh, some of the, the things I'm going to share with you have, bec have come about because of the enthusiasm here, which uh, I'm very grateful for. Okay, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to talk to you about two different things this morning. They're very different. So begin at the beginning, a little bit about trends, drug trends, drug and alcohol trends, why we might be interested in thinking about trends, um, what they are, and I'm going to share with you a model, so a very practical model we've developed in Bergen to pick up and monitor um, trends. So, new trends. I show my age here by some of these pictures of things that, uh, when I think of fashions and trends, um, you think often of young people, you think of leisure, you think of music, um, you think of innovation, fashion. I had one of these space hoppers when, uh, when I was a child, so it was ever, ever so exciting. I didn't have one of these, the boys had these bikes, chopper bikes. They were very trendy for a while. I don't know if anybody in Norway had these things, clackers. Yeah, there was a fashion for those too. So the idea being just introducing gently, as it's a bit early, the idea of fashion, trends, the things change. They don't always change that much. They very often go in cycles. Okay, so often we see things, platform shoes, those high heel shoes. Now, I was actually a little bit young for those the first time round, a little bit old for them the second, but they've, I've seen them come back. Okay, serious, serious now, drugs, drug trends. Um, talking about drug and alcohol trends, what do we mean? What are we thinking? Well, very simply, often we think of a new substance, a new type of drug, a new form of alcohol, those place, for example. Um, but we can also, when we talk about new trends, think about new ways of using drugs. So perhaps smoking something that traditionally has been injected. That could be a new trend. Or it could be a new group of users, perhaps a new age group. Um, or a new social group that starts using a drug that hadn't before. So that would be a new trend. Also, we talk about significant changes over time in the use of a substance, perhaps like cannabis, that's already known. So a new trend would be if it was being used a lot more or a lot less. Now, I have to keep looking up here because I haven't got one of those clever computers that shows me things. So if I keep looking here, it's because I haven't got it on my screen. I just want to give you some examples of actual drug trends. Heroin smoking um, was a new trend. Traditionally, heroin had, had been injected. I, that was the same in Britain and in Norway. And a new type of heroin turned up, which actually a brown heroin that could for the first time be smoked rather than injected. So that's an example of a new trend. Ecstasy. Uh, that was a new substance. Okay, so that, that came, was manu manufactured and actually the medicine originally, but misused. And here's another one that you may have heard about, which has been around recently, Rehypnol. Again, a medication, a benzodiazepine, that's gone on to the illegal market. So that's, there's been trends that have been picked up around misuse of rehypnol. People are talking a little bit about this at the moment here in Norway, cocaine. Um, in itself, that's a, a substance that's been around that perhaps is being used a bit more. Um, there's also, in Britain at least, um, an increase in use of crack cocaine which is the same substance in a different form. It's smoked as crack. 
Okay, so those are examples. Some of those are new substances. Some of those are medicines that are being misused illegally. Others are substances we know about that are perhaps being used in a different way or by different groups. Okay, little, little bit of theory when we're talking about trends. It's always good to have a small bit of theory. Um, a guy called Michael Agar, American professor from Maryland. He talks, uh, talks about drug use and says, drug use often occurs in clusters or groups, social groups, um, and that there can be a change over time, that, there's a, that who is using at what particular time can be dependent on historical conditions or circumstances. And he does a small study on the use of opiates in the States and has a look at who's, which social groups over time historically are using opiates uh, at a particularly high level. And it's quite interesting because he picks out three particular groups. In the early 1900s, it was actually middle class American housewives who were the, had particularly high uses of opiates. By opiates, we mean Nowadays we often talk heroin, but opium, opioids. Um, and they were, they were using them as medicines that were widely available, that they could buy. In the 1920s, it was a different group that were particularly associated with heroin or opiate use. It was young white working class men, often immigrants perhaps from, who'd come over from Europe, um, and they were using heroin, newly available at that time. After the Second World War, he finds, finds another group. It was African-American men, primarily, in the cities, often in slightly marginal situations, who were using heroin. Now, what he says these groups have got in common, and he does find that they have what he calls open marginality. These were different groups that, at the time, were outside of the main power structures. They were slightly marginal. Um, though they weren't completely out of, of society. They weren't in the main power-making structures. And he says these groups may well have been using opiates to give them some relief from this social con contradiction. So question, when we're beginning now back, back here in Everyday, if we have an interest in... Uh, Agar's theory, who could be the open marginals in Norway in 2005? Okay, just, just one more. Um, Dirk Korf, uh, who has worked a lot with drug trends in Amsterdam, he set up a project called Antenna, which particularly focuses on young people and very much a sort of um, party, um, avant-garde scenes. And he adds to this idea of trends and the marginalisation and looks at trendsetters, people at the lead of setting new trends. And he talks very much about avant-garde. He suggests that there actually are two groups of young people uh, where trends are most likely to start new drug trends. And he says, one, is this at risk or marginalised young people who are perhaps most likely to start with the sort of heavier drugs, injecting drugs. The other is trendy avant-garde, often middle class young people uh, who are more likely to start with new substances, synthetic substances. One group we know rather well, those of us that already work in the, in the drug field, the at-risk young people, they're often already in contact with some services or other. The, the more middle-class, avant-garde, trendy young people usually aren't in touch with professionals. They're usually studying, working, in employment. Um, we don't often have much contact with that particular group. We often don't really know what's going on there. Question, who are these avant-garde? Who are the trendsetters in Norway? If we're looking at trends, we need to know what's going on there as much as we need to know what's going on with the at-risk young people. Um, about 
five, five or six years ago, I was involved in a, a study looking at how, or which information sources could pick up on new trends quickly. I looked at ecstasy use in the UK. When ecstasy came to the UK as a new drug, the question I was asking myself is, who noticed? Who was the first to notice that there was a new drug in the country? Um, and it's quite interesting. The very first written reference I could find to ecstasy was in the youth press, Time Out magazine, which is a kind of listings, youth cultural magazine. The next reference I could find was in the local newspaper, actually, um, and that came a few months later. The, lo the last, or if you like, the, the latest references to come were from the official data sources. Um, and I put here, and this is true, that there was a six to seven year time gap between when the youth media reported we had a new drug and the official data sources, the quantitative uh, recording said, we seem to have ecstasy as a, a feature of drug use in Britain. Um, and that was, I also looked at heroin and I looked at heroin smoking, known drug, so it wasn't a new drug, but a new way of using, and that happened in the 80s. Again, same procedure. Who, who noticed? Again, it was the Face magazine this time, youth cultural magazine. Uh, again, this time six years late, um, with the national treatment databases, the seizure data. It all comes out really late. It doesn't mean that people don't know. It just meant the formal systems take a long, long time to report. So in both cases, information was available, but it was tracked and not made public. Now, that sounds quite extreme, but it's, it's actually true. And the, when, we, when I show you the model we've been developing, it's exactly this time gap that we've tried to close down. So that there's a shortest possible distance between noticing something, it might not be as dramatic as a new drug like ecstasy, but it may be something we should notice and, and worry about or wonder. Um, but to close that, that gap to at least, we're thinking months, not years. Okay, I'm not talking days, but, but, but shorter. Just to say that there are a number of different um, interesting projects working in the area of looking at new trends. I think the antenna project as, that I mentioned in Amsterdam is one of the earliest. And we certainly in Bergen have drawn on some of their good bits and stolen some of the things that, that we like that they've done in developing our own. Um, but there's a national system, so there's something called Pulse Check in America. Um, there's a, a pan-European project in France that's uh, called Trend. Just, we set up a project in Bergen in early 2002. Since then, there's been developments of further of projects in other cities in Norway, which is very exciting. So um, it's, it's growing. It's a growing area. Really, really simply, what's the point, if I haven't convinced you? <laughs> um, it's, it's, the point is that if we get information earlier, as professionals, um, then we have the opportunity to act earlier. Um, if, if we don't get the information, then we, we, we can say, you know, we have an excuse for not acting. But if we are told what's happening, then we have, uh, at least we have the possibility, if not the obligation to respond. So, we have, as I say, set up a, a, a project further up in Bergen. And this is the aim of the project. It's always good to, to have an aim when you're developing something and try and stick to it and check out whether you've managed to, to achieve it. But it was to establish a city-wide system that was able to, to quickly and reliably identify and, and feed back to those working in the area what's actually happening in terms of 
drug and alcohol use. So that's what we set out to achieve. This is what we do. We spend the day making jigsaw puzzles. Um, no, but it's not a very good picture of a jigsaw, but it is a bit what we do. Because when you're trying to monitor or identify trends, there isn't any one good source of information. I mentioned earlier that, that youth magazines were quick, so we would like them to be bits of our jigsaw that we look at. But there's also very good reliable routine data. There's good statistics. They may be a bit slow in my case studies, but not, not everything is that. So we, what we have to do is build a picture that's never going to be complete, um, but a good enough picture of what's happening. We come out with a report. This is a, this is the last report, our report from December 2004. We come out with a report on trends every six months. That's our aim. That's our quick enough, quicker than six years. But we use lots of different information for this report. We use a lot of routine statistical data. We use a lot of media. We look at um, local press. We look at youth media. We look at the FAG media. We look at the internet, different websites. We have some human beings in our system. Um, not just data. We, we have a, what we call a, a key informant panel. So we talk to people, and I'll say a little bit more about that later, but experts that we know what's going on in Bergen. We're lucky enough to have um, an Ungdoms and a Surfacer every two years, a school survey of Otna and uh, Tina cluster. So that's, that gives us some very good survey data. We also have worked with Utkontakten in Bergen and developed what's called a rapid assessment method and they, they're very good and do quick, rapid assessments, often on local areas and young people at risk. And we include those rapid assessments in our reports. And we have a panel of Schent men. Uh, I don't know if you know uh, what Schent men are. Um, not sure if my colleagues explained the model yesterday. No, it's um, basically it's a, that's a, a project we've developed with local Ungdom schooler where we train up a representative from each of the, the schools to have knowledge about drug and alcohol issues and to work in a prevention capacity so that they can respond to problems in their own school. And they receive ongoing tr training and support from us as a competence centre. But what it does mean is we have a network of people in schools that we can also ask questions to and say, what have you been seeing in the last six months in terms of drinking, smoking, drugs in your school? And we can actually, we do a questionnaire with them every six months too. So that gives us a, a view on a particular part of the population. Okay, these, these here, when we set up the project, we went to a number of key steps. Um, we didn't want to... Well, well, what we wanted to do was be sensible, and we tried, wherever possible, to use whatever good information already exists and pull it together. So not just create things for the sake, but use all the data that's around in Bergen on drug and alcohol. To, to develop our model. So we actually asked around, when we set the project up, we, sent, we, we talked to everyone we could think of and said, have you got any good data? Do you, do you collect anything? Do you have any good people, information on drugs uh, that we can use? Um, and we talked to about 60 different people, sources, organisations and ended up actually with only about 
we used about 12 in our first report because we were quite strict on which data sources we could include. They had to be reliable, they had to report six monthly, and they had to be relevant. We did another thing. Um, one of the mistakes people have made historically is to, to only ask the people they know about what's happening. So they only look at the areas that they know about and they miss new trends because they're not looking outside the box, their professional area. So we tried to do it a little bit differently and start with a cultural mapping of Bergen and drugs. And that involved going out and it was great for me because I was new at the time, but talking to lots of people, talking to young people, saying, what's happening here? What are the music, different music arenas in the city? Um, are there any types of drug use linked to that type of hip-hop, for example, punk, gothic? Are there any special places, special drug use issues? Leisure. Skateboarding, cycling, motorcycling, taekwondo. Any particular... Oh, there's a bit of steroid use going on there. Oh, that club. We did, did a bit of mapping out into areas we wouldn't normally have thought of as drug workers, as well as the more risk arenas. In Bergen, that's Nigel's Park, for example, or Torgelmenningen. So we looked at, at risk groups and risk places. We came up with a really nice, interesting big map. And after that, we set up a panel of key informants, which were our experts. We tried to get key people telling us what was going on in a whole widespread um, different, different scenes in arenas, across the city, not just in the areas we knew drug use was occurring, but areas we weren't sure about and areas we wanted to keep an eye on. <coughs> what we do have is a six monthly cycle now. We're actually on our fifth report, so we've got into a little bit of a, a system um, whereby every six months we run through collecting information, talking to our informants, writing the report, and afterwards, very importantly, going out and sharing the findings with people in Bergen. We go visiting the prison, for example, and telling them what we found and answering questions. We go back to Utkontakt every six months to discuss with the prevention workers there. We talk to our own staff in Bergen's Klinikna. Um, we had a had a really good um, launch of the last report, um, a seminar with over a hundred people, professionals, coming and hearing this, this six months, what's actually happening, discussing with us the findings. So this is going back to the jigsaw. So what we're doing, we're basing our findings on a lot of different pieces of information. The last report we had 48 jigsaw pieces, if you like, 48 sources. Um, those are the sources there that we used, and our challenge is to make a logical picture out of so many different bits and pieces, an internet site and statistical treatment data. How can you make a story of those? It's quite a challenge. Um, people sometimes say, okay, so you come up, and I'll share some of our latest findings with you in a minute. People say, how, how reliable, how can we trust your findings? Can we trust them? And, of course, it's a good question. My answer to that is, well, usually policy-making, practice, decisions, if you're lucky, are made on one piece of evidence, one research report that's come out, the police, the slug for this last year, um, a media story, very often, panic, leads to policy or, or um, practice decisions. Well, we've got 48 different sources here that we've looked at, and, and we think that's relatively, relatively reliable compared to the one or two that people normally make decisions on. I'm not going to read these out, <laughs> um, but this is our statistical data. So... For our last report, these are, if you like, this is the hard stuff that we use. 
you can see it's a mixture. We've got um, we've got sort of Vin Monopole, Vectura. So we've got some alcohol sales data. So we can see what's happening there. We've got some um, data in terms of, from uh, Apotec. So we have an idea of what tablets, the levels of, of, of medicines that are being given out. We've got uh, Spreta. Yeah, a mix, quite, quite a good mix. And we've built up over time relationships with lots of these different agencies so that we get some of this data quite early. And these are the um, media sources that we use currently. We've got different methods for looking at the media. Sometimes we can, we can do internet searches and count how many times a particular substance is mentioned. And sometimes we have to sit down and read and pick out interesting articles. For the, uh, some of our internet sites, we, we basically just go and visit and have a look what people are up to. What are they, what are they talking about? What, what, what's interesting for people using those websites now? This is an example of one of the, the sites that we look at. It's an internet site called pills.com. Pills um, and it's, it's where people write down their evaluations of ecstasy tablets. So it only tells us about one drug, ecstasy. But we look at the level of interest from Hordeland. <clears throat> How many people from Bergen are, are using this website? And we just keep an eye on it and note the number of hits from Bergen. I mentioned earlier that um, the key informants that we use came about as a result of a cultural mapping. And this is just an example of the very early maps that we started off with when we went and talked to young people, talked, went to the record shops, went to the clubs, and said, what's, what, I mean, I could, it was easy for me as a, as a foreigner, I could go and say, look, you know, I'm a bit stupid, I don't really, I really know how it is here in Bergen, can you, can you explain to me, which of the, you know, does this make sense, are these different music genres relevant? And, and it was, that had some really interesting conversations, and I was put right and told how it really was, and and we, we ended up with some very interesting maps, after which we set up our panel of key informants. We used, going back to that theory earlier, if you remember the bit about uh, avant-garde and the marginals, we followed that idea that if we were following new trends, we needed to have key people in those arenas, in avant-garde and in the risk arenas. We, um, we didn't do so well, actually, finding a very big avant-garde in Bergen. Uh, we, we looked and looked and asked and asked, and we found kind of a bit trendy art people, but it wasn't a particularly big avant-garde scene, not like in Amsterdam, and, and I think that's understandable. But what we did find was there was a, a mixture of trendy and utile, where new drugs, new tablets tended to be um, tried out. So we picked some key informants from that arena, young people and professionals and staff like bar staff, der Wacht, um, clubbers themselves. We picked uh, again professionals and drug users from the more marginal arenas and we, had so we picked some um, key informants that had a bit of a broader overview of society. People like the police who, who link into different milieu, health services, ambulance drivers who again will meet different um, groups, teachers who will see young people. And that's a list of the, the, the actual key informants we use are, are anonymous. So this is a, a kind of 
an idea from Amsterdam, actually, of the, of the sort of groups that might be involved as key informants. I'm going to, this, it is quite an interesting area. It's the one area that we developed something new. Instead of picking up existing information, here we actually created a new um, data source. And we have a questionnaire for our key informants every six months. These are the topics or some of the topics we ask so we can see any change every six months. We interview our informants um, once a year to go a little bit deeper and to ask questions about things we've wondered about, worried about. We give um, a garba court to the young people, um, not to the professionals, I'm afraid. They, they do it out of their own goodwill and love. Um, but what we do do is we try and feed back to all of our informants and build a relationship so we can keep them and, and we share our findings with them. We... Um, all along have been a bit worried about not reporting, not creating trends, actually. As a, as a project, one of our dangers is by shining a light on something, we create a new trend. I'm particularly worried to, to um, have, a, have a role in squashing, uh, cutting rumours and trying to get good information. And this is just a little technique that we have on the questionnaire. Um, when our key informants report something new, like hmm, there's been a, a new drug in my Umgangskreis, or uh, then we say, okay, is it something you've heard about from one person, heard about from many, or is it something you've actually seen yourself? I have to put a ring round, whichever. Um, and we only report the things they've seen themselves. And that's one of the things we use because, of course, there could be a small news report that lots of people have seen uh, about, ooh, Rehypnol being used in Umdom School, for example. And everybody's seen that or heard that news report, um, but nobody's seen it. So that's an example of how you could create a story. We try to prevent that. So this time, our, we had 28 key informants, a mixture from those three arenas, a mixture of men and women. We've tried to get people not just white Norwegian but from a mixed from mixed ethnic backgrounds. And they're half fog folk and half uh, drug users and young people themselves. I'm just gonna show you one or two findings from this last key informant um, study. Now what you need to remember is this is one of 48 sources we use. So it's an interesting one, which is why I'm just going to show you one or two things. But we use the data from this alongside the other 47 Kilda. Um, here we asked our key informants which drugs were most used in their arena. Now this isn't something we can generalise out, of course, because we've only got 28 in total here but it gives us a little sense of what might be happening in the city. Um, and unsurprisingly, perhaps, we see alcohol um, and cannabis featuring most highly. But there's been a bit in the Uteliv, amongst our informants reporting on the Uteliv in Bergen, for example, we've seen cocaine has moved up. In brackets, you have what they reported last time in that position. So cocaine's been moved up a place steroids has been reported as used quite highly in uh, the Italy. That's a lot of coming, I think, from the, the Dervacht, for example. Um, but also amongst young men who are out dancing, normal young men too. Um, I'm not going to make much bigger a story about that, but, but that's something we often discuss with practitioners and, and have a look about what we think might be going on. <coughs> This is an overview. This is quite an important um, question. For each drug, what trend have our key informants seen in the last six months? And this is all 28 together. And usually, and understandably, there's in an ending. There's no change. Because there isn't that much change in six months, typically. Um, 
So that's quite good. But what we pull out here is where people have seen a change. And this report was looking from last Easter through to the end of the summer. That was a six-month period. It ended in September, was the end of our six months. The report came out in December. So we were rather quick. We were two months reporting. That time, anabolic steroids were increasing, they said, in terms of use, cannabis, ecstasy and LSD down. And perhaps the, the biggest one was the misuse of Subutex, which is um, a substitute for heroin, is used as a, a med medicament. That was being misused. There was a lot more Subutex on the streets. We ask about price. So we pick up changes in price in drugs in the city. We ask about availability to Lienglihet. And we don't always get the same answer as Brugstren. You would think they would be the same, but not always. It's another important question. But they usually coincide somewhat. So there, the drugs that were reported as being used more we're often around more. This is one people sort of, what did you ask that for? Well, we try and uh, pick, keep abreast, that means keep up, with the, the street names for drugs. One of the, the things that does happen sometimes is people worry that there's a new drug around, and actually it's just a new name for an old drug. So one of the things that we try and do is, is keep up with what names are being used for drugs at any one time. I mentioned our Shentman pen, uh, panel. They don't tend to report very heavily on the illegal drugs. Tend to, to more get uh, reports around tobacco and alcohol. But it gives us part of the picture as to what's happening with the, the younger generation. And we can also look to see if it agrees with the survey that we do, the school's survey. Can you read that? <laughs> You're not expected to. Um, I just wanted to try and convince you that we do something sensible with all these different pieces of data. And in a, in a sense, it's our biggest challenge, is to put the jigsaw together. This is one of the ways we do it. Um, if you're really interested, at the end I'll give, you a, I'll give you a way of getting hold of our reports and they've got all this detail in. Okay, so all I wanted to say was by what we do here is we list the drugs and across the top, on, 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 we list the different sources. The, there's Tolokarton. We do the same for Nekalimpamanta. And we look to see what the trend has been from that source by that drug. And we look for patterns. We look where they agree or disagree. And on the basis of that analysis, we, meet, we have an expert group that looks at all our data. And we discuss what, if anything, seems to be happening as a kind of key finding in a six-month period. And these were... Oh, Okay, these were our key findings in the last report. Almost always, there's no change for a lot of substances. There was no big changes for alcohol sales. It was relative, relatively stable in relation to most illegal drug use. That, almost every time, that's been the same. And while we think that could be a bit boring, actually practitioners are saying, thank you for publicly reporting the fact there's not much happening. Because what we often have to, to deal with is, is the media saying, <gasps> drugs explosion. Or maybe some people doing drug prevention work saying, oh, things are really bad. And actually, very often and mainly, there's no change. So we've had rather positive response to, to and um, remembering to report that for most drugs, not a lot's happened. One or two, last time, 
there was one change that we reported for Bergen because it came up from so many different sources, which was that there was more cocaine around in the city. A mixed picture for misuse of medicines. Um, and sometimes there's even good news. And it's nice to be able to have a, a key finding that's good news, that there was a, a small reduction in the number of school pupils who had been drunk. And that came from our, primarily from the Ungdom and the Now, I'm not going to, to read these through. All I want to show you is that under each of those five headings, which sit on the front of our report, um, and sit on the back and sit everywhere so we hope people notice. There's a pyramid of, of data that supports why we've chosen to say that. And we, in the report, explain the different sources that support each of these findings. Here, for example, where we say things are, are relatively stable, we can say cannabis, that their seizures went down for customs. Though they seem to go up a bit from Kripos and the police, so we're not going to report either of those as up or down. It's levels out. The, the key informants, however, said there was a small increase. So, for each, each key finding, there's a, a justification, a rationale, an explanation of how we came to report that. We see our responsibility, as I said earlier, of, of then sharing our findings. I'm not giving you the detailed one because I'm not in Bergen and this is a a slightly different environment, but we will often sit down and have a, an in-depth discussion with the local services. Um, and we try and think, well, what could the implications be of what we're finding? And maybe that's about challenging people to think a bit, well, checking out, have you seen this in your work environment? We've been asking a bit about steroids because we've been picking up quite a lot of steroid use increasing use of steroids in, in the city. We've heard recently that rehypnol has been, having been a big, you know, quite high, the use of these tablets, it started to decrease. We're just wondering what's, what's being used instead or, or is nothing being used instead? There's, a, there's a, a question with cocaine. At the moment, the cocaine use seems to be limited, fairly limited, to uh, those with money, middle class users. But we know from other countries that cocaine spread into the more risk and marginal populations in the form of the cheaper and more dangerous crack. So we're kind of keeping an eye open for that. I think this was the title. Um, so, just coming full circle and concluding, what's the, what's the point? Why, why may we be interested? Well, as I said at the beginning, we identify earlier new trends, changing trends, and we have the opportunity for a faster and more effective response. Very fashionable at the moment, we have an evidence base um, if we have this information for, for practice. We have a reason, um, and I would say a good evidence base, for developing interventions. <coughs> we get in-depth information on patterns. I hope we're able to squash some of the rumours and false alarms. It's, it's really nice when the media, because they do phone us, and they say, oh, have you heard about this, or we've heard about such and such, is it true? It's very nice to be able to say, no, I haven't heard about that. No, that doesn't sound right. Um, on the, with an evidence base behind us. And last but not least, that we have a, a forum, a way that local people can share what they're seeing and what they know and check out with us uh, their own experience and expertise.
And if there's one thing I'm worried about is this crack cocaine. So this is a this is just this this is um, if early warning can come from other countries just to finish as well as from uh, and one of the interesting things with other cities in Norway setting up for our projects too is we can look to see patterns between Oslo and Bergen, Trondheim, Stavanger. Maybe for Bergen we need to take strong notice of what trends are picked up in Oslo because they might come to us next. Or it might be the other way around. Perhaps we need to watch Newcastle in Bergen, but, but perhaps trends come over from Britain with the boat. I don't know. But um, in last year, crack, crack cocaine use was so bad in, in London that they developed a, a strategy, an, an, a, a strategy specifically to deal with that. So uh, that's my early warning tip. Okay, rest. <laughs>